Hey everybody, it's Dr. Eric Ballcabs. We're back for another edition of the Thyroid Answers Podcast. And today we have Rebecca Stump. She is a thermographer and the owner of Thermography of Houston, but she's also a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. And uh, we're going to have an interesting conversation today around probably a little bit around functional nutrition and functional medicine and thermography, which I think is something that's underutilized and probably should be utilized more, especially in, in the functional health community. So Rebecca, thanks for joining us on the podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for asking me to be on here. I was excited when you uh, messaged me on Instagram. I follow you on there and you always share such such amazing information on thyroid physiology and holistic health and everything. So, well, I appreciate that. And I'll send you your, your check for that comment a little bit later. Okay. So that's awesome. Okay. But, I, will, I will hold you to that. All right. There you go. It does, I didn't say there's going to be any money attached to the check. Oh, I just said I'd send the check. So we want to talk about thermography today, but give some people your background. You know, obviously you, you have a, thermography clinic in Houston, but you're also doing functional nutrition. You might think those are two different things. So how did you get to where you are? How did you get into the functional medicine aspect? Yeah, great question. So um, it started from working with my mom, actually. So she was a naturopath and nutritional consultant. So I grew up taking herbs instead of antibiotics and things like that. So I, I just thought that was normal. And then um, Uh, as I've met so many other people through this work, I'm like, Oh my goodness. So many people were taking antibiotics from childhood. I, it's like amazing to me. Um, but yeah, so I started working for her in 2008 and she had already added thermography into her office because my grandmother, her mother, um, passed away from breast cancer and she had, she was a nurse and she was doing mammograms every single year. Like her doctor told her to, And, um, by the time they found it, it was like stage three breast cancer. So my mom had always questioned, you know, okay, they say this is early detection, but is it really? And, um, I think she's only had one mammogram in her life because, uh, she just didn't feel, she just had that like intuition of why am I smashing and radiating my breast tissue, you know, to check for breast cancer kind of thing. So anyway, she, um, did the research she was kind of a pioneer in my family and added in thermography to her practice. And then I was certified as a thermographer in 2009. So um, I had a, a early interest in that. And then she retired in 2014. She uh, encouraged me, gave me kind of the courage to start the thermography of Houston business myself and continue that service here in Houston And then um, more recently, I jumped into functional diagnostic nutrition, which has been just a delight and joy for me. Um, I think just my experience with my mom's naturopathic background and kind of having that understanding of how the body has such an amazing ability to heal itself. It's like, it's just hard for me not to want to help people. So (laughs) I naturally kind of expanded into that now. So that's awesome. So let's get into the thermography piece. So a lot of people probably not familiar with what thermography is. So can you explain Mm -hmm. to somebody what this is? Yes. Okay. So it's actually very simple. Um, You know, you can get all technical with it, but basically it's uh, measuring, it's it's a digital picture. We do digital thermography um, and it's images measuring the infrared or radiation uh, coming off of the skin. So it's a map, it's a map of um, the temperature activity on the surface of the body. So that's, that's really the, the basics of it. All right. So somebody's thinking there, okay, so why would I want to get this map of the heat signatures coming off of my body? Like, why would I want to do that? I'm 98.6 degrees. Shouldn't I have the same oh, all the way I through? That. That's right? such a great point. Yes. Yeah. So, um, Yeah, so you would think that the body temperature is just the body temperature, but um, what it actually, the 
the thermal activity on the surface of the skin is actually affected by the internal processes going on, external and internal. So like if you put an ice pack on your, on your skin, you're gonna see an external change, an external um, process changing that skin temperature, but you can have internal processes changing the, the skin temperature as well. So the sympathetic nervous system is what is controlling that surface temperature. So you have um, inflammation going on internally, you have poor circulation or increased blood flow, you have um, you know, an infection or something. If you've ever had a sinus infection or an ear infection, you can feel that ear is hot, you can feel that sinus is hot. So um, thermography is really a super, super sensitive, um, it's picking up on very, very slight temperature differences differences on the surface of the skin that you won't notice. You will not feel it necessarily. Um, and so that's why we're we're looking for like the earlier changes, the the preventive kind of um, area of changes in that um, balance there. So the body wants to be in balance. It wants to be in homeostasis. And in a healthy individual, it should be even from side to side throughout the body. So the doctors are really looking carefully for slight asymmetries in the body and that can indicate different things. Yeah, so for the listener, the, uh, a, a, a thermograph is gonna give you kind of a baseline, at least the initial one is gonna give you a baseline of what your, I use a term called like heat signature. Like this is where my, how my body temperature kind of mm -hmm. looks. And so somebody might get, think about, but, but why would I need that? And I think, the reason that somebody, this may be a good idea for somebody is if you get this kind of base reading, especially when you're healthy and you feel well, now you know what your body's kind of map or your heat signature looks like when you're healthy. When you're, then if you do this as a follow-up process or procedure and you get another scan done and you see like a area of the body that's got a really more intense signal coming from it, that may indicate an area of increased vascularity and increased inflammation, mm -hmm. increased tissue damage, right? Was that how you would explain yes. it? Yes. Yes. And I always love to share with people. It's not always the hot spots. So kind of like with your blood work, you don't want your numbers too high or too low. And so same thing with the um, heat signatures in the body, there's a normal temperature range for each area of the body. And if the ear uh, ear is not a great example, cause it's always warm, but like over the left side of the chest, when it's abnormally cool, the doctor is going to be more concerned about the heart. So same thing with the lungs, um, same thing with degenerative knees, um, degenerative joints and things like that, uh, really advanced arthritis. You see the uh, certain areas actually get colder with more damage. Um, so it's interesting. It's like it's it, you definitely want a trained person to be looking at the scan and not just take a picture and say, OK, where are the hot spots? Because you could easily misinterpret things. <laughs> yeah. So that's why it's, it's probably good to have like maybe the earlier you get a, a mm -hmm. scan done. So you get a better idea of what a good baseline is. And we talk about when I use this terminology, heat signature, that's just kind of the standard. And then if something deviates that too hot, or colder, then that's where we have to start to take a, a closer look at something. And so, yeah. right. And so for those that are listening, they're like, I don't, I still don't think I understand what's going on. If you saw the movie Predator, right. And this is probably a terrible example. You you may not even know this movie, but Predator, there's this alien, right. And they can somehow see the heat signature of the alien as it's moving through. That's how I kind of think of the, of the thermography. All thing kinds of applications for thermography. I'm telling you. Right. Right. Aliens and all. Mm -hmm. So what kind of issues might somebody might, why might somebody say, cause they may be thinking, well, why is this important to me? Right. I got a thyroid problem. We're listening to the thyroid problems podcast. Why might this be something that a we'll talk about maybe someone with a thyroid condition, why this might be important, but why might it be important for other conditions and what other conditions will we look for? So how about for somebody from a thyroid perspective, why would somebody who's got problems with thyroid health, why would, might they want to consider getting a thermography? Ah, well, I think you well understand uh, with thermography, I mean, with thyroid conditions, how it's not just isolated to the thyroid. So 
all of these other um, peripheral tissues, as you love to talk about, um, you know, their, their level of inflammation and dysfunction going on can interplay with the thyroid's adapting to that dysfunction in the body. So um, getting that whole body view would be really beneficial to evaluate. Are there some areas in the body that we're not really aware because there's not pain in that area necessarily? Because I mean, we know there can be inflammation for years before there's any kind of symptom going on, right? And we know it's a core, um, you know, underlying cause. I don't really think inflammation itself is a, a reaction, right? But it can be a sign that there's something causing that inflammation there that needs to be investigated and addressed so that you don't have that um, chronic dysfunction going on and stressing the thyroid. So people would be surprised, um, you know, the things that we connect to their fatigue and their inflammation. I know we talked yesterday briefly, but, you know, root canals and infected crowns and, and things like that going on in the mouth. Well, you think about all of that coming down into your lymph nodes here and kind of increasing a lot of inflammation in this area. So, um, you know, people, I think a lot of people underestimate the, the dental region, just that one example uh, that can often contribute to things. So, so when we talk, when I talk about thyroid physiology, I like to simplify it down from maybe Dr. Karazian's kind of, Hey, there's all these different patterns to, is it a glandular issue? Is the gland exhausted at this point? Or do we have a peripheral cellular tissue issue going on? Mm -hmm. And so the people who listen to the podcast probably have heard me talk about that ad nauseum. And so if you have chronic hypothyroid symptoms, but your TSH is still normal, you, if you had a thermograph done and we saw we said, hey, you've got hypothyroidism at the cellular level. If thyroid gland still seems like it's holding on, we know that that when there's a set, when cells or tissues are under stress, they're going to slow down normal metabolism and ramp up cell defense. And that typically means we're ramping up the inflammatory mechanism. So I think what you're saying is, hey, if you did, if some, if you came in, if somebody came in for a scan and they're having that symptomatology, and you did a scan and said, hey, your oral cavity is really showing a change in heat signal from what it should be, that may be an area of where that inflammatory, that cell danger response, that threat's coming from because people with root canals often have chronic infections within that. And one of the, one of the really primary sources sometimes of organisms getting into the GI tract is through the oral cavity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so if, if, when I'm working with clients and I'm sure when you're working with clients, you kind of look for the root cause, what's driving the stress response. And if you did a scan of somebody and you saw that you'd say, okay, maybe we need to be looking at what's going on in the oral cavity as your root, that was part of that root issue of where inflammation is coming from, where that danger signal is coming from, where potentially infection may be coming from. Would you see if somebody had an unknown gut issue, would you see a change in temperature maybe within the GI tract as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've seen that really, really frequently. And it's, again, not always tied to the symptoms that are present in the patient. So, you know, I love it when the labs line up perfectly with how the patient is feeling. But the benefit when we're doing thermography is that, you know, oftentimes we're seeing dysfunction or inflammation in the gut that uh, precedes that symptomatology. So, uh, I think that's really important. And I, as long as the, the client or the patient is willing uh, and wants to do more preventive approach, you know, I never push that on, on thermography patients, but, you know, I say, Hey, you know, you can be proactive about, about this. I mean, you don't feel terrible, but this is something that's presenting itself as an opportunity to be proactive and preventive. So I, I kind of leave it up to them because not everybody wants to do that approach. But, um, you know, when we look at disease and the Western medicine model, it's waiting until it's a full-blown disease and, and it's uh, a lot harder to turn around at that point. And you have to do a lot more uh, harmful treatments and interventions. So, yeah. And so for, I think it's important for the, for the listeners to understand is that this is like another tool 
mm-hmm. in the functional medicine, especially that, or it could be in a functional medicine toolbox, like, Hey, we run blood work, not necessarily to look for a disease or disorder, but we run a comprehensive blood chemistry panel, many times more comprehensive than your allopathic physician, because mm-hmm. we're looking for a 30,000 foot view of what's going on. Yep. This to me is another potential tool to say, Hey, we've got our blood work. Let's take a look at the scan. Let's see if anything is changing. You know, it's just another really good tool. HRV is a great tool. Looking at resting heart rate's a good tool, right? Looking at your respiration rate's a good tool. Looking at a comprehensive blood chemistry is a good tool. And this is also a potentially another really good tool. And the thing that's really important is that often you're exactly right. The problem, by the time you know you have a disease process, you're pretty... pretty far down the line already. I, you, I, I talk about this all the time. You know, the literature so, shows that by the time somebody's actually diagnosed with primary hypothyroidism where their glands exhausted, they've lost 90% of the function of the gland. That is not the beginning of a thyroid problem. That is like mm-hmm. the end stage of a thyroid problem. And so somebody might say, well, why doesn't my doctor intervene sooner? And unfortunately, based on the guidelines and based in the tools that they have in their toolbox, their tool is, I got to give you more thyroid medication if you're hypothyroid, but you probably don't need that extra thyroid hormone in the system too early because that's more, it's more aggressive therapy than really at that point in time, the body needs instead of thyroid hormone, what you really need to address is, hey, what's going on here that's causing the peripheral tissues to deactivate thyroid hormone? What that What's causing the immune response at the thyroid gland, the thyroiditis that may be causing that destruction? So many mm-hmm. times we say it's just the immune system out of control. I'm not a big fan of that theory. I, I Based on what I've read, I still think that's part of that protective response. So this could be a really good tool. It could be one of those things that somebody could get done, what, once a year, every couple of years, just to do like kind of a screening yeah. process to see what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so could it be also used as an early indicator of potential thyroiditis? I think so. I really, really hope that they do more research on that. Although with the present approach, um, where they wait until 90% of dysfunction is, you know, um, they're pretty late in the game as, mm-hmm. as far as their approach. And so I don't know that they would see the benefit in finding thyroiditis sooner, but from a functional medicine approach, you know, those types of practitioners and providers would see the benefit of that. So I think that, like you said, um, thermography would be a good fit for functional medicine uh, clinics, I agree wholeheartedly. I think that that would be a quicker, um, sooner intervention and a sooner, you know, sometimes it really just takes showing the patient, Hey, this is, we're going in the wrong direction here. Do you want to do something about that now or later? And so just presenting that opportunity, I think is really helpful. And a lot of people just need that little bit of motivation to like, okay, I do need to eat healthier. I do need to stop drinking soda. Like, you know? Yeah. Well, I think for a lot of people, especially the, the, the people that I see and um, the people, it's a lot of people that listen to this podcast, you know, they're frustrated because they feel like they have a thyroid condition many times uh, for months or years long before they're actually diagnosed with primary hypothyroidism. And Mm -hmm. labs, we don't have like specific markers that say, okay, this is a tissue hypothyroidism or, and it doesn't tell us maybe where the, where the problem's occurring. Mm -hmm. And we still might not see the impact of thyroiditis many times until somebody actually sees the antibodies and says, okay, now we know that there's destruction of the gland, but this might be a tool that if you had a scan done and you saw a change in the heat signal around the thyroid that somebody might say, hey, look, you have hypothyroid signs and symptoms, and now we're showing a change at the thyroid gland itself. This, is, this could be a thyroiditis that's starting to develop at the thyroid gland. I know your gland's not shot yet, but this is an opportunity to start working on this process, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, we see it very, very often. And we also, um, like I've had a few patients where their thyroid comes up 
and a pattern on the T2 level of the vertebrae in the back here, there's a pattern where it's abnormally cold and around it is inflamed. And when that pattern comes up, it tends to show up on people who have an autonomic uh, dysfunction or immune dysfunction going on. And so when I see that and the thyroid, now I always recommend checking antibodies just in case, but when I see that combination of immune dysfunction and thyroid inflammation or dysfunction, I really encourage them doing antibody testing and ideally doing an ultrasound as well, because you know, sometimes the antibodies don't show up on the blood work, but you can see sometimes that the damage um, on the thyroid tissue itself through an ultrasound. So um, I try to give as, as much, um, you know, resources and, and tools that the patient can use to follow up on that. So uh, if you were looking at somebody's thyroid, is it possible that they may have both a warmer signal coming off the thyroid and potentially a colder signal coming off the thyroid? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Depending because on the state see, of thyroiditis, yeah, right? Or the exhaustion see, of the gland. Yep. You can see inflammation of the thyroid itself. And then sometimes the um, carcinomas on the thyroid can be actually colder. Is it possible as well? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it possible as well that somebody who's into that 90 plus percent destruction or damage of the gland that they, their the overall um, physiology of that gland may be so dysfunctional that there isn't a lot of vascularity and that the, 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 they get a general kind of cooling of that area because it's less functional. I think that's very possible. And again, like, I think this is an area of research that would be so fascinating um, and super helpful because there's no harm in, in doing thermography. There's no radiation. There's no contact with the body. There's, you know, no downside to doing it. It's just giving you more information. So if we had, you know, more research on that, I would be happy about that. Yeah. So I, I think it would be, a, I think it would be a really interesting thing to get done. The problem is probably the who's paying for that, that research yeah. to get done. There's no, yeah. there's no uh, pharmaceutical company at the other end of the line who's going gonna, to gonna pay for that type of uh, study, unfortunately. Yeah. But somebody might say, well, why this sounds interesting. Why would we not want to take a look at this early and sooner? It makes a ton of sense. Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't my endocrinologist, if this was really important stuff, why wouldn't an endocrinologist not be looking at this. Uh, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but my take on it, I think your take on it was from an endocrinologist standpoint is they're looking at hypothyroidism, primary hypothyroidism as the beginning of when they can start to intervene and the intervention, the tool in the toolbox is T4 therapy. And the, and the guidelines state you give enough T4 to bring TSH back into the, into the range. And that's, that's the treatment. And so you might say, well, wouldn't it be important to know that there's thyroiditis for your endocrinologist? And the answer really to me is it doesn't matter to them because they're, they're, the goal is to diagnose a disorder and then treat the disorder. They're not spending a lot of time on why did this, why did this become problematic? You know, we, you'll read uh, it's environmental, it's genetic, it's, you know, but it's kind of this broad kind of, well, we don't know what it is. It's idiopathic. It's so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. We're just going to provide the medication. And that's as soon as we get it back into range, kind of like whack-a-mole, we're good. And um, so I don't see that from an allopathic perspective, this is probably going to get a lot of traction because it's right. not going to help them necessarily well, diagnose. The it, it doesn't change the outcome, plan. right? Mm-hmm. So from a functional medicine perspective, we think it might be a good thing that could be helpful for somebody with a thyroid condition. It could be very helpful for a functional medicine practitioner because if the patient has signs and symptoms, but maybe the thyroid gland, that heat signal from the thyroid gland still looks fairly stable, that may be a way that we can say to the patient, hey, look, we're you, you definitely have deactive indicators of deactivation of thyroid hormone. We got multiple stressors. We have inflammation. Maybe we've picked up heat signals in other areas of the body that may be the things we need to investigate for why this happened. Um, 
And, but the, the gland, the gland seems to be intact at this point. So yeah, your doctor is saying, Hey, it's not a gland, a hypothyroid gland problem. He's correct. Matter of fact, we don't see the inflammation there. So you got two choices. We can get to work addressing the root cause issues, or you're going to wait until that gland gets damaged. And then your doc's going to give you medication. And the problem is, is that when he gives you the medication, you still may not feel good because mm -hmm. you still have that cell stress, that cell danger response on, which is, I think, what I did the, my Thyroid Thursday post this week, this video on this week was, hey, why, what, give me three reasons why you don't feel well, even though you're getting thyroid medication. So I, I think this could really be a thing that's another tool that help not only the practitioner kind of see where the advancement of the condition is, get clues as to where things may be coming from. Mm -hmm. um, but also to some degree, knowing potentially that they're actually on the right track and that thyroid gland actually starting to potentially heal and repair, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we have a, an intense, we see all the inflammation potentially around the thyroid gland and you get a scan, you're doing all these things, functional medicine type processes and procedures addressing root causes, and that inflammatory signal goes down, and your labs look better, and you're converting better, that's a really nice thing to see to say, hey, mm -hmm. we're on the right track. Not only are your labs yeah. feeling, looking better, not only is your symptoms feeling better, but the potential damage we were seeing at the thyroid gland is actually looks like it's getting better, which is great. Right. right. So other areas of the body, and the reason I got curious about thermography a while ago was because of family histories of, of breast cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, I, I'm not the smart, smartest tool in the shed, right? And I'm a dude and I don't get my breast x-rayed very often, but it just seems crazy to me. And I worked in the hospital for a while in my younger days that we would take a woman's breast smash it in between some pieces of plastic, then radiate it to look for damage mm -hmm. and do that on a re fairly regular basis, right? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that creating damage in to the tissue? A hundred percent. So I can't say it's not. So it, to me, doesn't it seem oxymoronic to say, hey, we're going to look for damage by creating a bunch of damage and we're going to do it every year until we see damage develop, right? Yeah. Yeah. And what, what the mainstream message is, is that the harms are way outweighed by the benefits and the risk is so low. And uh, they oftentimes give that analogy of, of the amount of radiation to uh, in a mammogram is the same as going across the country in a plane, right? That's the analogy that they give. But what they don't explain is that their, their, um, their calculation of that is based on scattered radiation throughout the whole body, that amount. But you think about that versus all condensed into that amount towards this tissue that's actually really sensitive to radiation exposure. And then at the same time that you're uh, exposing it to ionizing radiation, which causes DNA damage, you're also applying up to 45 pounds of pressure that can cause um, tissue inflammation, of course. And then that inflammation at the same time as, as DNA damage and free radicals, um, it's not a good situation to be doing all the time. And I have so many, um, you know, points about this, I could talk all day long. But, you know, one thing I just recently learned was they talk about how it's low low dose, right? It's a low energy radiation versus a high energy radiation. And I always thought, you know, low dose sounds like it's better, right? But what's interesting about high energy radiation is that when it goes through the body, 90% of it comes out the other side, only 10% of it is absorbed or, or stays in the body. With low energy, only like 40% comes out. So like 60% stays in the body. So you actually have more absorption with the low energy radiation. And then the women who have dense tissue or larger breasts, larger breasts and dense breasts, 
actually absorb more radiation than fatty breast tissue. So like 40 to 50% of women have dense tissue. I don't know the percentage of large breasts, but it's not a small percentage of women who are absorbing more radiation than what they really convey or what medical professionals even really realize. They absorb like four to seven times more radiation. So it's, they're already at higher risk and they're absorbing more radiation. It's just not a good situation in my opinion to be doing that every single year from 40 to 80, 40 times in your life and it's accumulative. Um, so, you know, I think that there are other things that we could be doing to reduce the, the um, occurrence of, of mammograms being so frequent in a woman's life, so. So let's go back to the dose thing, because I think that's really important. So for somebody, they're thinking, wait a minute, if it's higher dose, right, or higher intensity, that should have a more damaging effect. And you're saying, hey, the lower dose actually potentially has a greater potential for absorption and damage, right? It's, it's the, the energy output of the radiation. So it's, there's the dose. Mm-hmm. And then there's the, um, the energy level of that radiation. So there's like high energy and then there's a low, so low, like low frequency, low frequency, potentially greater dose to the tissue absorption, yeah, absorption, absorption. to the tissue. Mm-hmm. So how do, how do can we relate that to, to real life? So that may be, maybe the way to think about that for the listener is to say, if you had, uh, and you could say that's totally, this analogy is totally wrong. That's fine. I'm fine with that. But if you had a rainstorm that poured down really intensely and really quickly, it may not really soak into the ground because it's so fast, so intense, and it's gone that you'd say there's so much water that everything should be soaked. But really, you may get more depth of penetration into the ground when you have a slow, steady rainfall because it's slow and steady. The water actually, it actually gets absorbed versus just running off the top. Would that be kind of accurate? I think that's a good analogy. I'm not a a soil rain expert, so maybe I'm wrong too, but I think that's a good analogy. (laughs) So like the, the intensity can make, can make the difference. So yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's concerning. So what is, what's the tissue that most often gets people come in for thermography? What are they most concerned? Is it breast tissue? It is breast. Yeah. Breast screening is the majority. I would say half of our scans are just breast scans. So it's definitely the majority. And um, I think, you know, it makes sense because we don't do full body mammograms. You know, it's like women, a lot of our clients, they're like, I just don't, it just doesn't make sense for me to go smash, you know, my boobs in it. And it really like, it's painful. Some women, it's not as painful for them. And other women, it's really, really painful. Um, and then a lot of women who come in, they're like, oh my gosh, every time I get a mammogram, they call me back and have to do more mammograms and more ultrasounds because they have dense tissue. Right. And right. it's such an, um, a needed discussion in mainstream um, news. It's like, why don't women understand this? This is really important information. And thankfully in the last few years, just recently, I think it was 2019 or something recent where they finally made it a federal law that health professionals are supposed to and need to tell their patients whether or not they have dense tissue and that that can affect the accuracy of mammography. Now they don't ever expound on that and and give more information, but they at least have to say that. Now women don't understand, typically they don't realize that when they have really dense tissue, mammograms can go down to 48% uh, detection rate. So it's like a a coin toss, whether or not you're gonna catch breast cancer or not when you have really dense tissue. So at the same time, you're at increased risk more so than family history. Um, it's more of a risk factor. So um, it's a very important, important topic, I think, for women to know. So most, most women aren't going to see their physician and, that visit, and they're getting a breast exam. They're, they're not getting their breast exam and somebody say, hey, I think we should get this checked. Let's go get you 
a thermograph, right? That's just not a typical conversation mm -hmm. in allopathic practice. So somebody might be saying, well, why wouldn't my, why wouldn't my medical doctor recommend this? If this is less damaging to the tissue, why isn't my medical doctor recommending it? Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I think that part of it is there's a lack of education on current research. There's, you know, if you go to, I think it's radiology.org and you search thermography, they, uh, you know, just the general radiology opinion on it. Um, the research that they quoted their, their um, kind of like dismissal of thermography being a, a, a useful tool they're quoting research from the 70s. That's that's been completely flipped upside down since then. I mean, our our technology has advanced. Our research is extensive. We, I mean, hundreds of thousands of, of participants and studies. Some of the studies are are over 12 year periods. Um, really well done, and they've done um, studies comparing mammograms versus thermography and also the combination of the two. And every single research study that you can pull up on breast screening, you're going to see, no matter what tools they're comparing, you're always going to see that there is better detection rates when you combine multiple screening tools. It's just always better to do more than one perspective of the breast tissue. So for thermography, we're looking at the functional physiological changes. The mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI are looking at the anatomical or structural changes. So when you pair functional and anatomical together, you're really getting a lot more information um, and can make better clinical decisions with that. So can you explain that to the listener, like the functional change versus the anatomical change? Like, what does that mean for our listeners so they can better understand? You're mm -hmm. looking for the change in heat, blood circulation. They're looking for what? A lump. A lump or a calcification. So, you know, they're looking for when the cells have doubled, you know, if there's cancer, it's doubling every, you know, typically 90 days or so. So over time, it's like takes, I don't know what, a billion cells or something to get to the size where it can be picked up on a structural imaging, right? With thermography, we're looking for physiological physiological changes in the breast tissue or the activity of the breast tissue that would um, be like a first alarm that an unhealthy functional process is happening in the breast tissue. And that can be changing before we, we get to that size of it, a lumping there. Now, some women are like, well, why do I want to freak myself out and see that there's this, this change happening and I go get a mammogram and nothing's there. So then do I just have to like sit there and wait and be freaked out for a few years before, you know, it develops? No, you know, there's so many things we can do to uh, balance the hormones. I mean, hormones is a big deal with breast cancer. Estrogen dominance is a, is a big risk factor in how you're processing your estrogens. And we, Dr. Eric looks at that with Dutch and so do I. So, you know, how that picture is really important, your inflammation levels, your um, angiogenesis, you know, there are herbs and nutrients that can help reduce that. Uh, when I say angiogenesis, I mean, new blood vessel growth and increased blood flow. We can reduce those things. Um, you know, diet and lifestyle. One, one thing that uh, a lot of people blows their mind when I tell them this with the general public is that only 5% of cancers are directly linked to genes, to genetics, um, and 5%, right? So 95% is environment, diet, lifestyle, 95%. Right. What we call epigenetics, right? And I think I, I told you, I meant to pull it up to kind of review and point it out for this for this podcast. And I just didn't get time this morning, but uh, I, I used to say, you know, if you look at hypothyroidism from, from the perspective that I am, that it's not broken physiology, but adaptive physiology, cell senses, danger, cell senses that there's a problem, the cells down regulating metabolism to slow down metabolism and address the threat. If you look mm -hmm. at it from that perspective, that hypothyroidism is a protective mechanism 
to me, I always thought, well, if it is a protective mechanism, then providing more thyroid hormone to a system that's trying to downregulate its metabolism could potentially be problematic. And I would say that nobody's ever going to do this study. If that's the case, would anybody ever do a study to find out if people, if cancers are more prevalent in people after they've been put on thyroid medication. And I said, for sure, nobody will ever do that study because it doesn't, it, it doesn't benefit the people who would, who would pay for the study. But in 2019, a paper came out that showed that almost every form of cancer, there's a greater incidence in people who've already been diagnosed with hypothyroidism and been put on, on thyroid medication, have a greater incidence of almost every type of cancer, including breast cancer. And for the listener, you may be saying, what, how is that? How, why, why would that happen? Because thyroid hormone, when we think about thyroid hormone, we're thinking about what's happening inside the cell at the nucleus, at the mitochondria to stimulate normal metabolism. But thyroid hormone also can bind to the outside of cells called integrin receptors. And that can be the thing that helps cells multiply. And that's not Mm -hmm. a good scenario. If you've got six cells and the body's down regulating metabolism, so you don't generate more six cells. And now we flood the system. And then now we've got T4 not getting into the cell, but binding to those receptors. Now we get cell replication, we get more and more sick cells. And it they, it's not a today, like a tomorrow thing. I'm going to go on, on thyroid hormone. And then, oh, I got, I developed some form of a cancer. It's like five years down the line that the incidence is greater. And so nobody's going to tie, think about tying right. their cancer to their, uh, to their hypothyroidism in the, in the start of medication, but the literature really points that out. So that's why this is such an important piece for people to understand is, Hey, I'm not, and I'm not saying you, you sh- if you get diagnosed with hypothyroidism, you should not take thyroid hormone. I'm not right. saying that, but what I am saying is we really do need to take a step back. If that literature and that science is, a- is accurate. And I believe it is based on, on where it was all pulled from, then we have to start to say, all right, when you're somebody's diagnosed with primary glandular hypothyroidism, the glands exhausted, there is a need for some thyroid hormone in the system, but we want to put in as little as, as ne- is needed to support function and keep the patient safe. But then we must, must start looking for that underlying cause or otherwise we have the potential, the tr- a, a treatment that's done for the right reasons may potentially have a pretty significant negative outcome if we don't understand that there's a potential reason. It's not just, it just happens. The gland just gets shut down. Right, right. There's the why behind it. There's the reason behind it. And when you just throw more hormone into there and to the body that's adapting, it's literally just putting a bandaid on it and trying to you know, treat the symptoms without treating the underlying dysfunction. And so of course, there's going to be some kind of um, down the road, bigger issue that happens because that underlying issue is never addressed. Yeah. It's like kicking the can down the road. Uh, We'll Mm -hmm. deal with it later, or we're not worried about it, or it's a totally different condition. That's a breast issue. I'm a thyroid person. I give you thyroid medication. That's a breast issue. It's totally different. Everything is connected. Everything is connected. Mm -hmm. And this is why sometimes I'm kind of beating the drum on, on thyroid medication, especially from a functional medicine perspective, because people, when they don't feel well on T4, they go to somebody in integrative or functional medicine because they don't think the allopathic physician is doing the right thing with T4. They get put on T3, they feel good, they Mm -hmm. have their honeymoon period, and then they continue, then they start having their symptomatology again, and they don't feel Mm -hmm. good. Now they need more T3 and more T3. And I just had an appointment with a patient, new patient this week, who that was exactly what was happening. They weren't converting they were, they were hypothyroid. They were put on T4. They weren't feeling good. They went to an integrative physician, naturopathic physician, nothing against integrative medicine or naturopathic physician. But that person said, look, you're not converting T4 to T3. You're converting your T4 to reverse T3. You have a conversion problem. So we're going to put you on T3. 
And so they put her on T3 and what happened? She felt worse, more anxiety, more irritability. She yes, put on a bunch of weight. T3 went up. Well, her reverse T3 would not go up with the T3 because you're giving T3, right? So we don't typically, because if there's less T4 in the system, we sometimes don't see that big jump in reverse T3. Oh, okay. And so physicians sometimes say, well, if you're not converting T4 to T3, we'll reduce the T4 and put you on more T3. Now you have T3. But the same enzyme that converts T4 to reverse T3 will deactivate T3 to T2. But if you're not measuring, you don't see it. That's part mm -hmm. one. The other issue is when you put more thyroid hormone into the system, and especially if you start flooding the system with too much T3 into the system, you can cause that deiodinase enzyme that converts T4 to T3 to become ubiquinated or deactivated. So now they get more cellular deactivation than they even had mm -hmm. before. And that's essentially what happened to this one. She goes, I gained weight as mm -hmm. I went on T3. How is that possible? I was gaining weight. As soon as I stopped taking the T3, I stopped gaining weight. And wow. so it's not the right mechanism. Her doctor was saying, hey, I'm giving you the T3. The reverse T3 is blocking the receptors. No, it's not. It doesn't block the nuclear receptors and the mitochondrial receptors. I think that's some things that have been talked about in our, in our functional medicine model that it, there's a blocking effect there. It's not, there really isn't a blocking effect there at the nucleus and the mitochondria. So, but that's one of those issues where like, on paper, it seems like it makes sense. Oh, if you can't right. convert, I'll just give you the thing instead right. of saying, maybe, wait a minute, if I was able to convert it for the first 20 to 30 years of my life, how all of a sudden did my body forget how to convert it? Right. Or what a good should, question. Right. Or should I be going? Maybe there's a reason for that. Right. Maybe there's a reason why the cells don't want to convert T4 to T3. And maybe I shouldn't be putting more T3 into a system like that. But mm -hmm. so I want to jump back here. Allopathic physician, not maybe schooled on it, maybe doesn't even know that this parallel universe of thermography exists, right? Because they're probably not learning a ton about it in med school, right? Nope. No yeah. rep is coming to their office to say, hey, we got this new technology you can do, right? And you can refer everybody to you, uh, to us, and we'll, we'll help you out here. So I have medical physicians I take care of who had no idea that functional medicine even existed. <laughs> you know, like, I didn't even know it. there's a parallel universe. I didn't even know it occurred. Mm -hmm. And I think to some degree, when you ask an allopathic physician, maybe about thermography, and you can kind of maybe build on this, how many of those allopathic physicians probably know a lot about thermography? A lot about, th I mean, they might know a little bit about thermography, like one in... I don't know. I honestly don't know. There's thousands of doctors here in Houston and I haven't talked to all of them, but I just, the rate at which the conversation I, I do have, um, maybe one in 50, maybe, I mean, that know a little, you know, um, that know a lot. I would say there's a handful in Houston that know a lot about thermography. Um, I was encouraged. There was one doctor, uh, an oncologist at MD Anderson, who uh, you know made remarks to one of our patients that, "Oh, you do thermography? I think that's you know great. I I think that's better than mammography." And I'm like, "Okay, can I just have you go on the news and say that in public because uh, people just don't know. They don't know the options, and I don't." Um, I don't ever want to come across saying, you know, we don't need to do mammograms anymore that, you know, let's just throw that tool out of the box. Um, no, it definitely has its place and it has its benefits. But again, when you look at the dangers and when you look at the, the subpopulation of dense breast tissue, you know, and the, the hurdles that that creates for mammography and the lack of adjunctive screening with ultrasounds and thermography, you can see how there's so much area where we could improve how we're doing things. So it could just, it could be used more, almost more as the initial screening tool, maybe on a consistent basis and save the, the radiation piece for when, Hey, maybe less frequent so that you're still getting that kind of 
data, but also when you see something potentially uh, at the breast tissue where, hmm, that's that needs further investigation, that may be a case where, all right, now let's get, that's definitely go get, it's now worth, maybe more worth the risk to create, to get that breast tissue x-rayed. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. And I think especially when you combine thermography with ultrasounds, you're getting both of those perspectives of functional and, and anatomical. And I think that that combination could easily be, you know, above 90 to 95% um, accurate for women. And that that's very powerful to, to, I mean, both of those are completely safe, but very uh, thorough and reliable. And then um, using mammography when, when more necessary, I would, I would think um, there might be a benefit to doing a baseline mammogram at 40. I could see that being very helpful mm-hmm. to know, like you said, in the beginning, getting that baseline, that you can compare back to um, because a lot of women have, you know, little asymmetrical densities in the breast tissue that are benign and they're fine. And so if they get one at 40, they have that baseline, they do their thermography and ultrasounds, and then, you know, something changes there. uh, You can do that mammogram and you have that baseline mammogram that you could see changes there. But um, yeah, I, we shall see, but when you, you know, as far as, as the accuracy of mammography versus thermography, we have some really great clinical research on our website that, um, you know, there's these huge studies where thermography was, was outperforming mammography. Um, and that's, again, not to say not to use mammography, but it's because both tools had a percentage that did not see the cancer. We don't have a tool that sees 100% of cases. We don't even have a situation where when combined, it's 100% of the time. So you still need to do your self-breast exams. You still need to do, you know, really focus on wellness, right? I mean, screening is not going to prevent breast cancer. The biggest thing to do is to take care of your health. Right. But as far as early detection, um, you know, combining tools is the best best way to do it for sure. And when we talk about, early detection, I think you alluded to this earlier. It's like, if you have, if you have, let's use the gut as an example. If you have, if you got constipation and diarrhea and you got gas and bloating and you went to a gastroenterologist and they did a pathology based exam and said, Hey, there's no pathology there. They may give you a functional disorder diagnosis called IBS, right? It's a functional disorder. There's no pathology. What's the, the Rome guidelines say, Hey, keep doing that every year, keep doing that pathology-based testing. And eventually when they do have a pathology, now you know what to treat, right? In the meantime, you manage their symptoms. There's still a functional problem there, mm-hmm. right? The Rome guidelines will tell you that is a functional problem. Yeah. The problem is in the, in the allopathic world, they don't have more in their toolbox other than to provide symptom relief. But this that is the place for functional medicine to come in and say, hey, you you have a functional disorder. Now go see somebody who works on these dysfunctions so that I don't have to deal with the pathology in five years. It's the right. same thing here. If somebody get, does that screening process and they see functional changes, right, or dysfunctional changes, then we can start to work on those things. And yes, you don't need to sit around and go, oh my gosh, I've got this heat signal, increased heat signal, and what could it turn into something? That's when you get motivated to say, okay, what can I do? What should we be looking at? We should be looking at estrogen. We need to be looking at thyroid physiology. Are you taking thyroid hormone? Are you taking a lot of thyroid hormone? Maybe we need to back that down. Maybe we need to look at your estrogens and how they're metabolizing. Look at a Dutch test. Look at your comprehensive blood chemistry panel. Look at your health. Look at your timeline. See what might be driving the problem. Are you... Why are you taking this hormone replacement therapy? Well, because I want to be young. Well, okay. But it may be creating another problem here somewhere, right? So it gives you the opportunity to engage earlier, right? Yeah. And I think to some degree, some of these things are considered woo-woo, right? Maybe still like, like, well, it doesn't show pathology. We're not necessarily... 
we're not necessarily always looking for pathology. Want to see pathology, right? <laughs> right, right. We, we want to try I and get it before. My and I heard somebody say that. How do you know? Like, how do you know that they didn't just get better on their own? I'm like, what? I'm not arguing that point. They did get better on their own because of the thing interventions we did, changing their diet, changing their lifestyle. And so, and the person said, well, but they didn't have, you couldn't prove that they had a problem. Well, they had a functional issue. They had signs and symptoms. They had labs they that are out, better. right? They, they feel, feel, feel and function better. Hi. True. We didn't have a pathology to say, hey, we fixed their Crohn's disease. That's not, that, that, can, that can's kick too far down the road potentially. But if we can keep more people from developing chronic disease, isn't that the game? Isn't that what we should be doing, right? Not always in treating after the, the dis disorder, after the cancer, after the breast cancer, after the thyroid primary hypothyroidism. We want to catch people in their early dysfunctional state so we can get them back to health. That should really be what, that's what functional medicine is all about. Allopathics really more really good at the acute diagnosis and the management of disease. And there's a whole bunch yeah. of people that only want disease management, right? They don't want functional medicine. They don't want to have mm -hmm. to change diet, change lifestyle. And sure. so functional medicine may not be appropriate. You need both allopathic medicine, functional medicine. We should, these two professions should not beating their heads against each other. They shouldn't be circling the wagons and shooting in. We should say, hey, there's a place at the table for everybody here. And everybody does well, especially the client, if we work as a team. And mm -hmm. you know what? The biggest problem, we, one of the biggest problems we have in this country is the cost of sick care in this country. How sure. do you bring it down? You don't give people more money. You don't change. You don't have to change the insurance model. As far as who's paying, who's not paying. What you need to do is we need to put more emphasis on real health care and recovery mm -hmm. care than we put on disease management and disease diagnosis. That's the real issue we have in the real fight. And I think mm -hmm. allopathic physicians are doing things for the in really for the right reasons. Functional medicine practitioners are doing things for the right reasons. We need to get our heads out of our proverbial asses and actually start trying to figure out how we can do a better job of working together, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Rant over. Good. So I still have a couple of questions. If you got a couple more minutes, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So how would you recommend that somebody utilize, somebody's listening to this and they say, all right, uh, this is interesting to me. It's something I would like to get done is get thermography done. Where I'll, I'll kind of walk you through this. Where do people find thermography in, in their area? Is, and where do they find, where would you recommend that they go to find more literature, more research so they can become more educated on it? Mm -hmm. There's a great website, um, thermologyonline.org. And that has uh, research on there. And they also have <clears throat> a national directory of clinics. So I found some clinics around your area in Pennsylvania. So you've got some, some clinics not too far from you. Um, I'm down in Houston. So we've got a lot of different clinics around the Houston area. And we go out to West Texas and stuff too. But um, yeah, there, I mean, there's clinics all over the place. I would really recommend going to that website because it's um, associated with companies that are using medical grade thermal cameras. So there's a lot of industrial thermal cameras that have been used for uh, screenings. And I don't recommend that. Um, there's just, it's higher quality. It's FDA registered and everything. So um, it's more reliability, more accuracy and everything with the Medi-Therm cameras. And then they also partner with a, um, the largest medical group for interpretation. So um that's why I recommend that website because it's connected with kind of the, the high quality um, interpretation and equipment that these clinics are using. Okay. And so the, the type of equ equipment that you think is best it'd be on that site, but what was the type of equipment that you think is best? Medical grade. Okay. So uh, Medi-Therm is the uh, manufacturer for the medical grade cameras that we use. And um, so you can check out those, uh, those. Uh, check the website. Of the camera. Yeah. Okay. And so now the next question that almost everybody would have is, okay, I want to get it done. 
I know I can go to that the website, kind of look around, and I can do a Google search and find who's got it. I know I want to make sure they've got maybe a medical grade cameras that they're using, right? Um, do you, is this the next question somebody's going to ask? Is this is an insurance covered service, right? Because people have been conditioned that you know if it's insurance doesn't cover it, it's not medically necessary or not right. clinically relevant, right? right? So is it typically an co- insurance covered service or is it typically not an insurance covered service? No. Nope. So supplemental insurance like Aflac will cover it. Health sharing companies, a lot of them will cover it. So if you use like Liberty Health Share or whatever, um, they'll cover it. And then you can use your health savings account or flex spending. So HSA and FSA accounts can be um, used for this. But general, like the big companies, Aetna, Blue Shield, uh, those kinds of companies do not cover demography. Okay. So I think we've covered why you might want to pay for this out of pocket because contrary to popular belief, your insurance company isn't necessarily out to make sure you stay healthy. They're in to be in business and make money and it is beneficial. The sicker people are, the more money that is being made. That's not necessarily nice to say, but that's, it's a business and it's a reality. So the more claims you submit, the more money is paid out, the more, more, um, uh, the more money that can be charged in next year. And that's how insurance companies make money. So um, you want to just give maybe three key points why somebody might want to invest in getting a thermogram done maybe once a year, once every other year. Yeah. Um, I think really, so the top three points, I would say one, it's completely non-invasive. There's no radiation there's no harm in having a thermography scan done versus other medical imaging that use contrast and um, radiation. So very, very safe. It's highly sensitive to early functional uh, changes, inflammation, dysfunction in different organs, uh, circulation issues, nerve issues. So there's a lot of different um, ways that you can evaluate early changes in the, in your health with it. And then, um, you know, really like for the earliest uh, detection. So like getting the baseline, like Dr. Eric suggested, I, I recommend for women to start like 28 to 30 for the breast screening. If, if they're curious what, when to kind of start that uh, because with mammograms, you're waiting, it, it takes a few years for that mass to get large enough. And so we know it's been present for several years And we've had a handful of clients that have serious breast cancer at 35. So I recommend women starting, you know, at the least 30 years old and getting that baseline before something is happening, because we know that 95% of the time there are epigenetic, environmental diet, lifestyle things that are influencing the breast tissue. And oftentimes we can see those unhealthy changes and go ahead and get started on addressing those sooner than later and potentially preventing that progression there. So those are my big, big. Yeah. And and so for, then the next question might be, what what should I expect, right? If somebody's getting a full body scan versus if they say, I want to get, you know, from, from breasts, maybe a thyroid, or full body scan, what would you typically recommend for uh, somebody who's going for their first time? Would you recommend a full body scan just so they can see? And what would you expect costs to look like? And I know it's different based on areas of the country, but what's a good kind of ballpark, would you say? Yeah. So the ballpark, I would say anywhere from like 150 to 250 for one area or a breast scan. Like if you were to just do one region, it'd be like 150 to 250. If you wanted to do the whole body, it ranges from like 350 to 550 at the very most. But usually it's like 450 to 500 range um, for a full body head to toe. So, and what they can expect, um, you know, you come in and uh, we do one section at a time. We do some, some overview images, but we also do one section at a time. It's kind of like having an x-ray where you're the patient standing there and they're taking little snapshots Um, You do have to be undressed because there's no radiation. It doesn't go through the clothing. So that is part of the process, Um, but super, super comfortable. 
Um, we try to go as, as quick as we can for patients. And then um, you get the report back. We send it off to the doctor. We get the report back um, from them. And usually that turnaround time is like a week, but we can do urgent reports and get it back the next day. Um, and I feel like there was another question you had in there. There were two questions. So gen like in general, if somebody's going for the first time, maybe a yeah. full body scan makes yeah. the most sense initially. Yes. Then yeah. you get, the then you body, get your... that's, I highly recommend doing the full body first. So many women come in and they're just checking the breast area. And so often I'm, I'm educating women that, you know, your breasts aren't isolated. They're not like separate pieces from your body. They're connected. Right. And we know that you're like an infection in the mouth root canal can increase uh, risk for breast cancer. We know thyroid dysfunction can play into your hormone balancing big time. Of course, we know gut dysbiosis, um, bacterial overgrowth can increase estrogen reabsorption through beta glucuronidase. So we know there's all these other things that play there that are affecting the breast health. So let's go beyond just checking here to see if there's some major issue. And let's look at all the other areas that could be playing into that picture of your breast health. So, <laughs> and then once you have that first scan done, you know, that's where you may make a decision. Hey, do I get this done yearly? Do I get this done every couple of years? And it may be based to some degree on finance. Like you may not mm -hmm. have the expendable income, but at least if you get a base and then if you, if you can only manage that maybe every couple of years, you're still kind of kind of keeping on it and see making sure that you're potentially catching things as early as you may potentially be able to catch things before they become right. a disease or a disorder. Right. Yeah. Right. And one thing I didn't touch on that's super important for breast screening with thermography is that with your very first breast scan, we really need a three month follow-up breast scan to be done. Every other area of the body is very, what I call cookie cutter. Um, you know, when you're looking at the scan and you can see whether there's dysfunction or not there with the breast area, every woman has a unique thermal pattern. It's like a thumbprint. So it's unique to that woman. And we don't know initially, we don't know for sure if those patterns that we're seeing are normal for that woman, or if there is actually, if, if that little pattern here, if that wasn't there six months ago. And now all of a sudden it's there. Um, we check again in three months to see if that's evolving or if any patterns are changing over time. That's super important. And I'll, and very different from mammogram and ultrasound because it's like they're just checking if there's a mass there or not. We're looking at the activity and the heat signatures. So the, the breast area is really unique in that uh, it's individual to that woman. And so we need that comparison over time to make sure her patterns are stable. It should be stable over her lifetime. It may fluctuate a little bit, right? But the doctors are making sure that that's relatively stable before going the whole year out. And once that baseline is established, you know, once a year, once every couple of years is, is great. Okay. So you go in, you get your full body scan. Definitely. You might want to go back and get the, it's within three months, just double check the breast signature. Mm -hmm. If there's anything else that maybe somebody thought, eh, maybe we need to recheck that area as well. You may yeah. wind up either getting other parts done or getting and maybe a whole yeah. scan done again. Right. Yeah. We've um, seen a lot of women they'll, they'll come in do the full body. They see some gut inflammation. They see a lot of inflammation in the chest and then uh, they come back in three months and we talk about, you know, some diet and lifestyle changes and the hormones go, go get that checked. Uh, and then three months later, we see this massive improvement in those areas. I actually have a, a quick little visual. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. So this is a client who came in. This was her first thermography scan. So the red and the white and the orange, those are higher than on the heat signature. And then this was her second scan three months later. So she cut out her soda. She started upping her intake of um, anti-inflammatory things and uh, changed her diet and whatnot. So you can have a significant change on your health. And I think that's what is my big message for women and for men too, is that, you know, you, you should feel empowered with information. Hopefully we're, we're not inundating our clients with, you know, don't do this, don't do that and overwhelming them, but empowering them. Like, look, you can seriously help yourself here. Um, and this is another example I just wanted to show real quick. This is a patient who came in 
year after year and she looked totally fine. And then one year she came in and this was the change we saw. So I said, what is going on? Because on your paperwork, you said that nothing has changed since last time. Well, she forgot to tell me that she was put on a, a synthetic estrogen patch. Wow. I'm not doctor. This patient happened to be high risk for breast cancer and um, really, really high risk already. And then her ob based on some of the menopause symptoms she had, just put her on an estrogen patch without testing levels or anything. So when I saw this, I said, please go get your levels checked. Go see what's actually happening. And her estrogen levels were extremely high um, and dangerous. So, um, and, but her mammogram was totally clear, right? She saw this, she went and got a 3D mammogram and it was totally fine Well, because they're just looking for a mass. Right. So then it was a mass, they tell you everything's normal, everything's fine. It was not fine. So Right. And it, it may be, there's no pathology at the moment, mm-hmm. but potentially down the line. I, I mean, I've, I've just had recently had a conversation with a, a, a woman. She's, she's super knowledgeable about stuff, but you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, she's talking about hormones, high levels of estrogen, good for, you know, she's talking about bone density and brain health and how good yeah. it is, True. but, 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 but you know, you're miss. There, there's the potential. Hey, why is my thyroid not working as well as I wanted to? Well, because all that estrogen has a negative impact, but it's good for the brain. There is the dose makes the toxin sometimes until, especially in maybe an older woman who somebody's trying to force the estrogen level of an 18 year old into that woman because, hey, if an 18 year old's healthy with lots of estrogen, then you as a 65 year old person should be super healthy with lots of estrogen. But your detoxification pathways aren't the same. You don't have the same needs and demands for estrogen in the body that you did when you were 18. So it becomes really, really important. So I do want to finish off with this because we've been talking about, I think, more women Let's talk about the dudes. Yeah. How have you had dudes come in and get mammy, mammy or thermography done? And yeah. what might we see on a on a on a gentleman, a dude that <laughs> that, that may have somebody um, who's listening to this saying, "Hey, as a man, maybe I should be getting that scan done as well." Yeah. No. Absolutely. I mean, we see a lot of men um, for whatever reason. I have noticed a lot of our male patients have so much inflammation in their lymph. I don't know what it is. I don't know what you guys are doing, um, but there's like tons of inflammation typically in men. Um, so we see that we see that that immune dysfunction marker here. We see pre-diabetic changes in the hands. So when we, we see glove-like hyperthermia or warmer than normal in the hands, that oftentimes can correlate with uh, metabolic syndromes. Mm-hmm. And then we see um, heart issues, so cardiac dysfunction. Sometimes we see renal issues in the kidneys. Sometimes we see gut problems. Sometimes the prostate is showing up. Um, now, I have to give a caveat to that because they're like, be very mindful of mentioning the prostate because it's so deep and so small that you do need to have your other screening tools done. We can't like replace other checkups with your doctor. Okay. You still have to do that stuff. But, um, but sometimes that does come up on, on the thermography. And then we see um, degenerative changes. We see pinched nerves in the back that are affecting the sciatica or other nerves. Um, There's a lot of different things that we can check for, but the key, you know, the, the goal again is to find issues that are going on before the patient's having all of these, you know, breakdowns in their health. Oftentimes, you know, clients come to us and they're like, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, overnight, my body just started falling apart, right? They talk about hitting 50 and then all this stuff happens. Well, that didn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen that fast. Right. It takes uh, years of, of inflammation and dysfunction going on. So that's what the thermography is going to be checking for with the male patients for sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, it, it, it here, that's another thing that comes up and that we see that inflammation in the carotid arteries before there's that plaque buildup because the plaque is responding. Plaque's um, not the, the root, right? The root right, is the damage right. that's occurring to the vascular system. Mm-hmm. So There is, I think one of those things too, is if you're one of those people who potentially has, I've got back pain, I've got neck pain, nobody seems to know what it is. 
thermography could be a thing where you look at it and go, okay, look, I know you think you have lower back pain, but I'm showing a heat signal on your kidney, or I'm showing a heat signal uh, or a change in signal in your abdominum, in, in your ab abdominal area. And maybe that is what's causing that referral pain. Maybe mm -hmm. that right shoulder pain that you're having, I've got maybe a change in signal about where your gallbladder is. And maybe that, I know you think it's a shoulder issue and somebody's treating you for a shoulder issue, but the reason that shoulder issue doesn't seem to get better is because that muscular change is the reactive change of the body and not maybe where the root is. Maybe you need to go get your gallbladder right. changed, right? Or checked right. out, right? Yeah. My dad, for example, he had this extreme pain in his thigh, extreme. He couldn't, he had to either stand or lay down. He couldn't sit he, or else there was extreme pain. And the poor guy had to ride a bus an hour to get to work in the mornings. And so he would try to stand on the bus and the bus drivers would sometimes make him sit. And he was just like in so much agony. Well, he went and got physical therapy and they're, you know, trying to do all these things for the leg and it's getting worse because all the exercises were straining his lower back. So we did the scan, all the issues are in the lower back, starts addressing the lower back and he's fine. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, like you said, those things can be in of the root can be in other areas of the body for sure. Right. So I think, uh, I think we did a good job there. I think we got it covered. So I, I, I think this is going to be a thing that I'm going to definitely, and we'll talk offline and find out where this is, who you, who might be in my area that you might have some mm -hmm. suggestions or some recommendations. Uh, get my wife and I to get this checked. It's, I, I know I looked into this uh, a while ago and I didn't see many practitioners. So I think there's starting to be more practitioners in the, maybe in the, in right. the area. Um, but I'll get some advice from you since you are an expert in the field. But if somebody wants to, if somebody in, in, is interested in get, hearing more about you, what you do, more about thermography, maybe they're in the, the area and they want to get a scan done. How do they find you? What's your social stuff? How does somebody find the, your, more of your information? Yeah. So you can find us at thermographyofhouston.com. We're on Instagram, just at Thermography of Houston. And so very, very easy. Reach out. Let us know um, whatever questions you have, your particular situation or concerns. And we can let you know if thermography is a good fit or if there's another diagnostic tool that would be a better fit. Sometimes we have people call and I'm like, you know what? You really need an ultrasound or you really need an MRI if you're trying to look at the brain. So um, I'm happy to help in any way that I can, whether that's through thermography or something else. So. Awesome. Well, Rebecca, I thank you for coming on the podcast. It was great. I, I'm sure somewhere down the line, I'll have more questions and we'll have to get you back on for another episode. So awesome. thanks so much for coming on. And for anybody who's listening to the podcast, finds this information important, I'll get the, make sure I get that li link for, from Rebecca for the website where she said you can go. I'll put that in the, in, in the information around the podcast. Share this with your friends and family because this literally could be something that helps somebody find a problem uh, and potentially save a life. So uh, we're talking about all the other stuff that we're doing right now to maybe save a life. Maybe this might even be a little bit more relevant. So thanks so much for coming on. And um, have a great weekend. Okay. Thank you. All right. Take care.